by Kim Goldsberry, who's with us over Skype. Kim? Hi. Good evening. Thank you, Kim. Now we'll turn to Bruce Naki. Uh, good evening. My name is Bruce Naki. I am on board. Um, uh, my wife and I came to um, Athens after my tour in the Navy in 73. Um, we, um, we have two children um, that went through the Athens uh, city school system. We're grown, have good jobs, don't ask for money. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, I graduated from Hocking, it was technical college then, it's now Hocking College. And um, I, I guess that's about it. I don't know what else to say other than uh, uh, my wife of uh, 43 years uh, is here to support me and uh, give it a shot. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. Let's turn to Chris Gary. Uh, good evening, Mr. Holt, Mr. Baum members of the league and uh, interested citizens, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. It's been an honor to participate in our Athens City School Board the last four years, and I've thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity uh, to work with people such as Mr. Nagy and other members of the board for what I feel has been a pretty successful four-year term. Um, by way of reintroducing myself, since some of you may not know me, I'm a lifelong resident of the city of Athens. I grew up here. I'm a graduate of East Elementary, Athens Middle School, Athens High School. Um, graduated from there, from West Point, and then Catholic University Law School, where I've gone on to practice law for the last 16 years here in the city of Athens. Um, I've had the pleasure of serving on multiple committees. I've also been president of the East Elementary PTO, helped to get them certified as a 501c3 nonprofit. And have done a variety of other boards and organizations over the time that I've uh, been living in Athens. Perhaps most importantly to me, as far as why am I uh, serving on a board like Kim, the she kids But what's important to me, and most uh, specifically for me, are my two children. I have one child who's in the seventh grade, Henry, and one child is a freshman at Athens High School. So we certainly want to make sure that we continue the excellence that they enjoy during their time. During my time on the board, we faced some challenges and we've seen some great success. Um, I would have to note we have had some difficult, sometimes painful decisions to make as our resources have been shrunk and we've seen never growing demands. But I would have to say that I have been continually amazed by the 
great efforts of our students, staff, and administration. I look forward to hopefully continuing to serve as your representative on the board for the next four years. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Now we'll turn to Alan Swank. Alan? My name is Alan Swank, and I better get this out of the way right now. Exactly 36 years ago this moment, my wife was sitting in the back row and I got married. So I'm here on my 36th wedding anniversary. Not as good as, not as good as 1973. I grew up in Akron, Ohio, product of the public school system there, went to Akron East High School. Left there and went to Muskingum College, home of John Glenn. And then taught for two years in North Central Ohio, a small town by the name of Plymouth. Taught there for a couple of years high school social studies in a non-graded environment, which means we put kids from 10th grade through 12th in the same class. After convincing the school board that you probably couldn't teach micro-macro economics to 10th graders, they kind of let me do my own thing. But after those two years, I came to Ohio University, 1979, which was supposed to be one year of graduate school. One year, one year turned to two, two to five, <laughs> two kids later, and two grandkids later, we're still here after 34 years. Technically, I cannot be called a townie. You have to be born here, either in Sheltering Arms or in Oblenis. But as my friend Joe Yandy said, after 25 years, you're a local. And I'm glad to be one. And I'm, what I'm really glad to see tonight are so many people in this community come out. Because it tells me one thing. Yes, they care about their kids. We all care about our kids. But we care about the educational opportunity that every student in this district has, regardless of attendance area. We don't have four elementary districts here. We have four attendance areas. And no matter where your son or daughter happens to live, I feel that each and every one of them needs to be provided a high quality education. Smart boards at East Elementary are great, but kids ought to have them in the Plains, kids ought to have them at West, and kids also ought to have them at Morrison. And as a school board member, I want to make sure we take care of state funding in the proper way where every student has that same opportunity. Again, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Alan. I think Ed Baum would like to have a brief technical check here. Ed? <laughs> would you just hold up one of those signs right now? <laughs> Turn it up. I see what's happening. It's just backwards. It's in the mirror image. Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> Next time I'll turn those backwards. <laughs> <laughs> After all, there's nothing here. A hundred years ago, you didn't have interruptions like that in your local League of Women Voters meetings, as though they went on like that long ago. Okay, now we'll turn to questions from members of the news media, and the answers here will be limited to one and a half minutes, the answers to all the questions on down the line. And so, first I'd like to call on Arian Smedley of the Athens Messenger. Arian? I should have indicated that the order here is the same as on the opening statements, and so Kim Goldsberry, you go first. Excuse me, Todd, can you please repeat that? I couldn't hear it very well. Could, we need to have the question repeated. Could you mention a challenge that the district currently faces and how you might be able to help address it? Did you get a, can you name a challenge the district currently faces and how you would address it? Or through 
your parent uh, donations. So if we can make our schools more level in terms of technology or possibly the music program or just making the schools level to give every student an opportunity, that would probably be what I would say would be one of our goals that we should try to reach. Thank you, Kim. Now we'll turn to Bruce. Thank you. Um, obviously, obviously, we have a number of, of challenges in the school system. And, and, and Kim's right, Adam's right, that, that um, they're all areas. And we got to be thankful for the PTOs and the other uh, organizations that do help out at the, at the various school buildings. Um, our biggest challenge, though, as a district and as all districts, is state funding. And um, we're just losing funding constantly, and uh, we need a, we need to see that turn around uh, in order to make uh, to make a difference. Um, but the, 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 there are challenges, and, and we try to meet them, and they just little bits at a time that we can do. And I'm hoping that um, the smart board issues and a lot of the other issues can be can be addressed over uh, over the time. Thanks. Thank you, Brooks. Now we'll turn to Chris Gary. Thank you, um, The uh, single biggest challenge I think we're going to face over the next four years are finances. Um, that you can't get away from that issue. We are, uh, as Bruce mentioned, facing a situation where our state aid continually gets reduced year by year, but we have more and more mandates that we have to meet. Um, what have we done to meet that challenge over the last four years? Well, we had to make some tough decisions, uh, but we found some innovative ways as a board to address uh, additional savings besides some of the ones I'm sure we'll address later tonight. Uh, we have had our bonding redone, which has dropped our interest rate on our bonds after 2017 2% annually due to higher rate we'll see that's going to save several hundred thousand dollars per year. We have cut our utility bills by either seeking efficiency and savings or signing a new natural gas contract where we were able to lock in a much lower rate for our gas. It's important that people understand I will try and provide a fiscally conservative approach to our finances and I will find every efficiency, every savings that we can to try and avoid as a last uh, as a last step an additional levy so that we can keep our programming at the level that it's at right now. But um, the, the board has faced some real tough times on that and I'm sure we're going to be talking about that more before tonight is through. Thank you, Chris. Alan? Thank you, Ellsworth. After those two years of graduate school at Ohio University, Dave Leggett hired me at Athens High School as an OWA teacher. OWA stands for Occupational Work Adjustment. And what that program was was a program for what we call today at-risk students. Back then we called them dropout prone, but today we call those students at-risk. Part of that job was doing home visits. I grew up in Akron. I knew what urban poverty was, but I'd never experienced rural poverty. And in doing those home visits and sitting with mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters, I saw another side of our school system that I didn't know existed. To me, the greatest challenge is making sure that we take care of those, like your children sitting in here today, and those kids on both ends of the spectrum. In the most recent state report card, the Athens City Schools received three Fs. Three Fs. Two of those three dealt with those disadvantaged and less fortunate students. Certainly, we need to take care of those. But also, we need to take care of those at the other end. And when I hear parents taking their gifted kids out of the Athens City Schools to homeschool them, we have some issues on that end, too. So from a curriculum standpoint, I think our greatest challenge is to make sure we are offering a comprehensive curriculum that challenges and meets the needs of every student that resides in this school district. Thank you, Alan. Now, before I call on Sam for the next question, why you've got the little chart there and the order of answering this question will be um, you, Alan, and then Kim, and then Chris, and Bruce. And after this, first of all, you can see how they go down and and only if you ask me, I guess I'll be volunteering. <laughs> and so, um, Sam Howard of the OU Post, we turn to you for a question. Um, uh, 
Can everybody hear me? Yes. Uh, the, the past few years have been a bit of a transition for uh, the Manhattan City Schools with the closing of Chancey Elementary. Um, how do you see the school district um, evolving over the next four years? Is it Sam? Yeah. Sam, that's a great question. You had been at the um, Board of Education meeting two ago, I believe. We met in the boardroom out of the um, district office in the Plains. We found out a very interesting fact. Way back when, the state of Ohio established the Ohio Schools Facilities Commission, and they ranked the schools from one to basically 612. That's approximately how many school districts there are in Ohio. And they started with number one, and whoever was number one was the first to get funding for new buildings. Well, believe it or not, 20 years into that program, Athens City Schools is on the list. In other words, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And within the next two years, and correct me, but Bruce and Chris, we were all at that same meeting, we're going to be up for consideration. Now, what are we going to have to do? One, we're probably going to have to ask the community for some money. How much depends on how much we qualify for. But in asking for that money, we're first going to have to prioritize how we're going to spend that money. Are we going to refurbish buildings? Are we going to add on to buildings? Are we going to build new buildings? Are we going to consolidate buildings? Now, before everybody runs home and reads the messenger tomorrow, I'm not saying we're consolidating buildings. They did that in 64, they did that in 46. But we're going to have to take a very serious look, and that's going to be probably the greatest challenge going forward, how we configure the school district, particularly its physical plant. Thank you, Alan. Kim, you're next, and did you hear the question well enough? I think I did. It's regarding over the next four years, how is funding um, the school district going to be evolving? Am I correct? Sam, does that sound good? Um, more or less just how the school district will be evolving in general. How, how the school district will be evolving in general over the next four years. Well, I think that's too part, honestly. We've got this core curriculum now that's being um, instigated in 46 states across the country, which is giving us some challenges. For instance, in sixth grade, the kids are supposed to be learning kinetic energy but yet their science textbooks have nothing to do with kinetic energy, and they're going down to the fourth grade classrooms and borrowing their textbooks. So the core curriculum is going to have a huge placement as to what's going to be happening in the school districts across the country. But then you also have to point out what Alan brought up, which is the school changes, the physical changes of our buildings. Uh, we have some really nice buildings, but then we have some buildings that need a little bit of improvement. And how we're going to do that, I'm not quite sure. And I know the state is going to be coming down and making an assessment of each one of our schools that are going to be presenting that. You know, our community is fantastic in supporting the schools. And we're going to need to address the best ways. We don't want to close all of our schools. I don't know if we want to be consolidated, but we have to be open-minded. If it comes to, are we going to be in grade club buildings? Are we going to keep the neighborhood schools? And we just have to be open-minded when it comes to that. I think there's going to be a lot of changes in four years, quite honestly. Thank you, Kim. <coughs> Chris, I believe you're next. Um, the question isn't what's going to stay the same over the next four years, it's what, or what's going to change what's going to stay the same. Um, our curriculum, as Kim correctly noted, has been dramatically redefined. Extend the board over the last four years as we move to the core curriculum. Um, there's going to be a lot of changes made as far as what is taught day to day in our schools. There's going to be a lot of changes as far as how teachers are evaluated on an annual basis. Um, and with the Ohio teacher evaluation standards that have been implemented, the physical plan itself has an opportunity to be redefined with the um, opportunity to take advantage of the additional funding that's going to be coming down with the state of Ohio. We're in the very early stages of that. I think if you were asking for the single biggest one, that could possibly be it, as we will redefine what the physical plant looks like for the next 50 years, perhaps, for Athens City School District. There's going to need to be a lot of uh, thought put into that and a lot of community input as well. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Bruce? Well, all three of those were very good and hard to, hard to add anything on to it. Um, but that's absolutely right. We have, there are buildings 
uh, that need to be fixed up. Um, technology needs to be updated. Um, our curriculum, um, as soon as the, um, well I shouldn't say that, I was going to say that the state seems to want to change the curriculum constantly so it's hard to keep up with it. But it is something that we have to do, we have to stay with it. And uh, I, think, I, think, I think we do that fairly well. Um, but there will be changes. There, there's going to be a lot of change over the next four years, and, and, um, or even longer than that. Um, and, I, and I know for sure that the community will be involved, they'll be asked, and, um, which, is, which should be the case. Um, that's about all I can say. Thank you, Bruce. From Kim, she can't hear the questions when they're asked. If you could maybe repeat them when they're first asked. I'll, I'll, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> Thank Thank you. You. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best to have to focus on the content of the question. Fine. <laughs> I'm trying to text her really fast the questions. Okay, so. oh, all right. <laughs> okay, so the third question, yes. you've got the order for question three there, and it's going to be you starting off, Bruce. And so, um, David DeWitt of the Athens News, a question, please. And boom, boom, boom it out loudly. Yes, I will. Thank you, Ellsworth. And this is a great time for my traditionally complicated questions. <laughs> um, so I'll try to be clear and loud. Um, with increased population and globalization of markets, there's also increased competition in the workforce. And my question is, what has the district done and or what can the district do to enhance curriculum to provide a 21st century education? Well, Kim, did you get that well enough? I, I got it, thanks. Great, thank you, <laughs> everybody. All right, I guess we're ready for Bruce then. Um, uh, well, David, I'll tell you, um, that's a, our curriculum, I think our curriculum, while there may be flaws, um, is a good curriculum. If you ask most of the students who go through Athens City Schools, graduate, they will tell you that they were ready for college. Okay. So I, I don't know where to go from there. Obviously, as things progress and um, everything changes, look at the technology. Um, that, that's, that's constantly changing. And, and, I, and it's hard for school district to keep that change. Um, you buy a computer today and six months later it's out of, it's out of, out of whack. Um, it's, so there's funding there. There's, there's money. It, it costs money. To, to keep up with technology. And I think with, um, uh, with that, we, back in city schools, along with, along with the, the help of the, of the taxpayers, um, we will continue to, to do the best that we can. And we've been fortunate to have that support. Thank you. Alan, I think you're next. Yes, sir. David, I was on the, um, selection committee for the new principal, I should say interview committee, I did not make the selection, the interview committee for the recent uh, process for the high school principal. And sitting through two days of interviews, five hours a day, it became abundantly clear to me that the Athens City Schools had a lot of work to do. Believe it or not, you cannot take a computer class at Athens High School. You cannot take a computer class at Athens High School. We use computers at Athens High School. We use them effectively. But you can't take a computer class at the high school. It has nothing to do with the size of the school or the money we have available. I was in Morrison Town High School in Morrison Town, Indiana last week, a school that has 93 students in grades 9 through 12. They teach computer applications as a dedicated class. They teach web design as a dedicated class. They teach Microsoft Office Suite as a dedicated class. We need computer classes. But you know what? Not everyone's going to be a rocket scientist. I was in uh, Logansport High School, Logansport, excuse me, Mount Anthony High School in Bennington, Vermont. That's how many art classes they offer in that class. 
In the arts, we also have music. At Athens High School today, you can take two vocal music classes. You can take four instrumental music classes. When I taught it, I'll finish later, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your courtesy. <laughs> I sort of chuckled because we need someone who had one thought that got cut off because that just says we all stick to the time minutes without anyone having to do more than a chuckle over it. They said so, you run a tight ship. <laughs> I thank you for your courtesy and stopping immediately. Okay, Kim Goldsberry, you're next on this one. Thanks. You know, I think that if we're just beginning to teach computer classes in high school, we're way behind the curve. My fourth grade boys are doing computer projects at home. And when we were looking at this computer program that East Elementary wants, we wanted something with keyboarding. In my opinion, we need to be teaching keyboarding in elementary school, not in seventh grade. Because we're geared around the computer, the technology. The one thing that Athens has to offer is we, we, we pass our levies. We've got the sport. We still have photography. We have art. We do have two music classes. We have a lot that other schools don't have. Uh, we don't have pay to play when it comes to sporting events. So we still support our education and we still support our arts and our schools. Can we do better? Yes, probably so. But are we willing to pay more? I'm not sure. We'll have to ask the taxpayers. But as, as a whole, we need to step up our programs. We may need to take away some of the programs that are no longer used and then add additional programs that may be more geared toward the, the 21st century. It's, it's great to hear a friend of mine that said her son learning how to sew in seventh grade. We need to keep programs like that. And it's fantastic that we still offer that. Our neighboring communities don't offer programs like that. Thank you, Kim. You're welcome. OK, and so now we'll turn to Chris Gary. Thank you, Ellsworth. Um, we talked about increased competition. We've adopted Common Core. We're focusing on the basics of education in the Common Core. It's going to make us competitive with the rest of the world as far as basic math, basic language skills, other basic skills that they're going to need to succeed. I'm sympathetic and I'm in favor of change when we talk about some of the additional classes we'd like to add. We're a district bill that's in fiscal, um, not emergency, but we're in trouble. We continue to hemorrhage money annually from our operating surplus that we have. Um, I, I certainly, as a kid who's got one, as a guy with a kid in high school, would love to see smart boards everywhere. I'd love to see additional electives. But we have to be mindful to the voters that we have to keep costs in check. We need to focus on basics of the education of the Common Core that we've adopted. I'm not, when we talk about computers, we don't have a specific computer class, computer classes per se, but they are adopted in almost every single classroom that we have out there. We have been in the process of making every single classroom in the school system a wireless classroom. So there's going to be great opportunity for every single class that your children take for them to participate in some kind of computer function to make them literate in that area. Um, so I guess that would be my answer. Thank you, Chris. Now we'll go to questions from you audience members. And Kim, I'm going to boom these questions out. And so if it's not clear to you, say so right away and ask me to be more careful. Um, okay, thank you. And so, and let's see. Um, Chris, you'll be answering this one first, and then Alan next for the question four category. OK. This one is on the topic of student performance on standardized tests. So the question, discuss how valuable you believe student performance on standardized tests is as a means of determining teacher competence. Chris, if you want to hear the question again anytime, just, just ask. No, no, good question. When we talk, well, you know, let me state as a precursor to this that regardless of what I think student performance on standardized tests is going to be pretty darn important going forward because of Ohio teacher evaluation standards. Um, I was, as a parent of kids going through the school system, 
while I was concerned about it, um, was not my primary focus, but um, there, when you look at the future, when you look at the things that we are required to implement, both from national and the state level, it's part of the future, and there's no getting away from it. And we have to accept that, and we have to do the best that we can to see that that's properly implemented, and that we give the teachers the resources that they need to allow their students to succeed on these exams. Um, I know Kim raises a concern the amount of time that we take spend on these tests. It's, um, it's true, but when you look at the high teacher evaluation standards that are required, when you look at the future, these tests are going to be part of what we're going to have to implement. And because it's an important component to the funding that we're going to receive, both from the state and national level, we're going to have to buckle down and make sure that kids and in turn teachers succeed on that area going forward. Thank you, Chris, and we'll go on to Alan. In 1973, when I took the SAT and got my scores back, I was real proud of my math score. I'm not going to tell you what it was, but I was real proud of my math score. My verbal score wasn't so good. And because of that, I got rejected at my first three choices of colleges. Ironically, Muskingum College took me, and I went down there, and I took a written essay <coughs> test. I ended up exempting freshman composition. I didn't have to take English in college. But I was horrible at analogies. Boat is the cow, as chair is the tree. Figure that one out, we'll all get A's on that. I think we're all smart enough to know that standardized tests capture such a small moment in time. If we ever get to the point where our teacher's pay or employment is solely determined by how his or her students do on a standardized test, then that's the challenge facing the school district, and we better blow it up and start over. That said, with Common Core, new state evaluations, it's going to be part of it. But to make that work, it starts at the top. It starts at the superintendent and his or her group of principals. They need staff development on how to implement it, and more importantly, they need the time and the resources to work with teachers so they're not afraid of the evaluation process and they're not afraid of what those test results are going to be. It starts at the top. And it's a commitment this district can make. Thank you. Let's turn to Gross. Huh. Standardized tests. You can they'll be uh, you can get two sides to that: the good and the bad. Um, some people think they're great; others don't. Um, but we have them, and and they're probably here to stay for some time until there's there's change. Um, our academic curriculum uh, for the teachers, their evaluations. Uh, this is this is a whole. You know, teachers have been evaluated for years. Um, it's just now all of a sudden something that somebody wants to the states and the Fed want to make a bigger deal of. They're always evaluated. Teachers are evaluated all the time. You will have, as in any business. Get ones who give 110 percent, all the way down to some who are just making it through. So you just have—that's an evaluation that is done. That has to be done through um, the, through the administration. And um, I, I think it's—it happens, and I think the new evaluations are going to make a lot of differences. Thank you, Kim. Standardized tests, they're not going to go away. Am I a fan of them? No. Should I think that a third grader should not pass and go to fourth grade based off of a two-hour test? No. There is a lot. We hire teachers for a reason. Those teachers should be able to pass the student on based off of what they know about the student. Should a teacher be evaluated solely off of the test? No way. Our teachers are so creative. And they do such a fantastic job. We should not evaluate them on a test. And I don't think we're going to get there. What concerns me is not the standardized test that we have to do in April, but it's the extreme testing that's being done now. 
I mean, do, do parents even realize that the first two weeks of school, our kids were tested, even the kindergartners, and they're doing weekly tests to modify whether or not they've mastered a, a program, and that, well, our testing is becoming too rigid. It's taking out the creativity that the teachers are allowed and have been given freedom to, and which we all know, kids learn best by hands-on experience. When COSI at Wheels comes to school, they learn about the different cloud structures by making a cloud and a tube with a bicycle pump. That's how they learn. They're walking out in the classroom and saying, oh, that's a cumulus cloud. They're not learning that from a textbook. We need to have a, a, a balance. That's what we need to balance. Thank you, Kim. And thank you for the courtesy and shutting it down with just those few syllables. I mean, all of your candidates are magnificent troopers in terms of our approach to the world here. Thanks. Let's go to the next question. And um, Bruce, you're on for the first uh, answer here, I think. Okay. Um, would you be supportive of students wanting to form a gay straight alliance? Would you be supportive of students wanting to form a gay straight alliance? I guess I'm not, I understand what your question is. Um, I'll just just um, make it a real simple answer. Yes. Okay. Fine. And then we'll turn to uh, Chris. When you say supportive, um, I'm not sure that I'm supportive one way or another of any um, legally protected group that wants to ally and create a club or otherwise they will certainly do it with the school's blessing if they wish to do so um, much like I'm not you know whether it's chess club or basketball or not basketball it's official but you know those who wish to align and um, create an organization and it's uh, legal or it, it would certainly be fine with Fine, and let's turn to, uh, let's see, Jennifer, uh, pardon me, pardon me, Kim, you're next. <laughs> such I've worked in schools in 28 different states and in doing so I often meet with administrators, building principals, school board treasurers, even some superintendents from time to time when we need to collect a bill. The last three or four years one of the hot topics of conversation with those people has been well I'll call an epidemic in our schools and that is bullying. Kids picking on other kids for a variety of reasons. I'm six foot five, Chris is six foot seven. Don't, don't go in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, in the <laughs> we set that up earlier tonight. <laughs> but it was easy for us to pick on kids. It, it, it is. Uh, we hopefully don't do it, but it was easy when we were growing up. Well, people get picked on for a variety of reasons. And one of them is their sexual orientation. Should they be able to form a club? Absolutely, without a doubt just as you can form any other club in a school. Do they need to follow the rules and regulations like the Honor Society, Student Council, the Chess Club? Absolutely. Understanding by forming clubs and having dialogue will be one of the ways that we can begin to diminish that problem of bullying. And having a gay straight alliance in a school would be a step in that direction. Thank you. Okay, let's turn to let's turn to the next question and candidates. This one is reasonably complicated, so I'll read it twice, and I'll try to give you the framework. 
faced with a significant financial reduction, prioritize the following in terms of what you would do. So we're going to have four different alternatives, and your job is to pick out from, I mean, you don't, you'd like to say, we're going to keep everything, we're going to eliminate nothing, but that's not the question. So this is your priorities. Which of the following four things would you choose to de choose first? Okay, so I'll read the whole question. If faced with a significant financial reduction, prioritize the following in terms of what you would do first, four of them. One, pay to play sports. Two, eliminate all non-mandated busing, which the parentheses say means high school, early and middle school within two miles of the school. Third alternative, eliminate elementary, physical education, music, and art. Number four, reduction in staff. So your job is to select which of those rather unpleasant things you would say, okay, and uh, Jennifer, did you get those well enough? Would you like to hear any of them again? I apologize. Kim? Yes. Um, wow. These are hard choices. Um, I would say that I would probably And you don't have to pick any more than that, but you, I'm sorry, you, you don't have to pick more than one of these alternatives, but you've got a minute and a half to fill, so you're, you're, you're welcome to go ahead. simply says which one would you choose and you're welcome to go down through the whole list or not but the question doesn't demand it so I'll just clarify that as I read it and so we will turn well that's uh, actually the, your audience got your priorities which well, they got more than the, the minimum so that's that's fine as far as I'm concerned okay uh, I think Chris I believe you're next thank you Ellsworth well it's a good question because this is a real world issue Two years ago, we had $2 million cut from our $29 million total annual budget. Um, our decision as a board, given these very options here, was to reduce staff to start off with. Hopefully, we found a way to reduce those staff members in a way that didn't deter from our core education mission. Um, what will I eliminate second, since we're uh, looking to excel in priorities, uh, I'll uh, probably do this in my peril. <laughs> uh, uh, well, core education mission was the most essential thing to me, so I would eliminate pay to play sports as the second, third, elementary, physical education, and art. Finally, busing. You have to get the students in the seats and have them participate in the core education mission. So, there's my one to four. Thank you. And we'll turn now to Bruce. Well, I'm going to keep mine very simple and say that I've got to follow, I think, I, I like, I have to follow Kim. And I, I think that um, it, they're all tough. And um, because as you, as you eliminate one thing, you might have to eliminate uh, or do a reduction in staff. So it all gets mixed up. 
but I, I, I'm going to have I'd say that I think Kim's um, right in her evaluation. Thank you, uh, Alan. I think the thing you have to look at is what's going to affect the ultimate mission of the schools, and that is the education of our children. Uh, the first thing I would do would be institute pay to play. In fact, we already have pay to play. We call it a transportation fee, but it's pay to play. Second thing I would do would be uh, to eliminate non essential busing. Uh, if you get out and about, our buses in many cases are a third to a half full or a third to a half empty. The next two, I'm going to do three, four, and five because reduction of force can be classified two ways. Reduction of force through attrition and retirements, and reduction in force through the elimination of people. If it was through, re it was through attrition and retirements, I would put that number three, followed by elementary, what we call specials, and why we call them specials, I don't know. They're an integral part of the curriculum. And the last thing I would do would be to eliminate teachers through methods other than force riff. And in fact, in 1982 and 83, when I was teaching at Athens High School, I was on the riff list. And it's not pleasant. And if you want to destroy the morale of a building, create a riff situation. So forced riff would be the last thing that I would do. Thank you. Well, let's turn to the next question. This will be easier to grasp because there are far fewer words involved. And let's see. Uh, Chris, you'll be first on this one. Please describe your feelings about an armed, quote, resource officer, unquote. So your feelings about an armed resource officer. Um, not going to happen on my watch. Um, the, say, I think this ties into the safety question. Uh, the, the school system has been very interested in over the last few years in the wake of such tragedies that we've seen. Um, our response with regard to safety was to bring in an independent evaluator and try and come up with thoughtful, effective solutions to, for security with regard to the school system. Um, it would be impractical and impossible um, to hire an armed resource officer, if nothing else, from the sheer number of schools that we have in our district. We have four elementary, several elementary schools, a middle school, and a high school. You would uh, add over $300,000 annually to our budget to be able to provide that kind of service. I would also note I, my sense of it in speaking with the uh, numerous parents that I've uh, talked with about this, that having an armed resource officer is not something that would be in keeping with the tone of the Athens City and the school district itself as well. So um, I, don't think, I don't think there would be any support for that at the board level. Um, hopefully the security solutions that we have implemented um, will prove to be effective and um, acceptable to the community. Thank you, Chris. And Kim, you're next. Last year after the Sandy Hook shooting that took place, uh, East PTO looked at this meeting. Uh, Chris wasn't able to attend, but Christine McGarrett came, Officer Rick, Carl Martin, uh, Chief Pyle, Ron Brooks from the City Police Department, along with several parents, and we brainstormed how to make our schools the safest that we can within reason. It, the majority of people were not for an armed resource officer, nor was I. And neither was the police department. Honestly, they felt like that would be a danger to the kids versus a help to the kids. And what we came up with was exactly what's been implemented so far. All of the teachers have been trained with ALICE training, a new method of training that um, looks at, instead of hiding in case of something were to happen, to take the situation in a case-by-case -case basis and react properly. We also have the monitor in every single door of every single school now, so that if somebody wants to come in, they have to look at a little screen like I'm on and they have to be buzzed in. If, if Linda Pierce or whomever it is at whatever school doesn't know who that person is, she's gonna walk down or have somebody walk down and escort that person into the building. And then they're also looking at, I mean, the city, uh, 
um, police departments have been at every single school looking at the safety outside in terms of traffic. They're doing a fantastic job, but I'm not for a resource officer at all. Thank you. And now we'll turn to Alan for his answer. Quite a bit of experience in this area, not as an armed person, but certainly not as a resource officer, but my daily job is to get up and visit schools. And I walk into elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools. In some places we see armed resource officers, some we don't. Some we literally walk in the front door that's wide open, and some we buzz. Some we're on camera, some we park in the back and go in the back door. Schools, by nature of construction, are not secure places. And to think that placing a resource officer in a school will secure the school 100%, it's a pipe dream. That said, I agree with Chris 100%. Number one, I don't think the community would support it. It has nothing to do with one's stance on guns or guns' rights. And number two, I have some real concerns about training and the safety that goes with it. So if I were a member elected by you folks to this board, uh, my vote would be at this point in time, based on my experience and the research I've done, no, I would not be in favor of it, even if the money were there. Thank you. Rose? Um, an armed resource officer would be absolutely the last thing on my list also. Um, after Sandy Hook, um, we, have, we have, without being told by the state to do something, which that will be coming down the line eventually, we can bet on that. Um, but all the buildings right now, we do have, as Kim said, we have uh, the equipment in place, um, the, uh, the buzzer, the cameras, the locks. Um, there are, there's still a little more to be done. Uh, some of it because of the computer needs to be all coordinated in with all of this, and it is being done. Um, but, but absolutely, um, an armed an armed resource or armed guard, if that's what you want to call them, besides the expense, um, I, I, it would be the last thing on my list also. Thank you. Well, let's turn to the next question, and Alan, I'm eager to answer this one first. There are more, whoops, too much. There are more and more demands in our schools and our teachers with the Ohio teacher evaluation system but fewer teachers want to take on student teachers. Yet student teachers and universities need more and more time in the schools. How will you work with the university on this issue? And if anybody would like to have it read again, feel free. I'm 58 years old. My father is 84, my mother is 79. And as such, they're experiencing health issues. I don't know too many of you who'd want to be in their position and go to a doctor who had not trained as an intern with another doctor. Our education is not much different. How many of you would want to place your students in a classroom where the teacher had never interned, had never had a mentor, had never found out about how schools work, had never had any hands-on training? We live in a university community and we have to do a better job of coordinating our efforts with Ohio University to get students into schools earlier and to get students from Ohio University more involved in our schools. If teachers don't want a student teacher, there's a reason. I'm not sure what that reason is. The reason is, I know in some cases, because I taught for several years both in Athens and in Plymouth, that there's a reluctance to, there's a reluctance to give control of the classroom over to that individual, that no one can do it as well as I can. Well, we may have to get by that ego situation. I know I felt that way. I knew I was the best history teacher at Plymouth High School. I didn't want a student teacher. But by bringing that young person on, it gives them an opportunity to be in front of a classroom and learn. So the day they have to do brain surgery, and education isn't brain surgery, they can perform it effectively and your parents can walk away healthy. Thank you. Uh, Bruce, you're next. Um, I, I, I also believe, and mainly because we are in a university setting, um, that we do need to have the, the student teachers in the classrooms. There has been, uh, I think over the last year, um, more requirements for those student teachers, uh, longer length of time in the classroom. Um, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but uh, 
there have been more requirements put on them, which should make them um, a better student teacher when they come out. Thank you. Kim, you're next. In my experience, I, I feel like the schools have been very accepting of student teachers and athletes. I think that they look at this as such a great educational opportunity for the kids. They look at this down the line for um, at when, when teachers did a great job of teaching others to teach. Um, I was not aware that there was reluctance to take student teachers on. Um, I can understand it because we're in a period of change because of our test and the fact that you're going to be responsible with the evaluation standards and the testing that are taking place where you're responsible for the work that the student teacher does as far as how your students perform. Um, I would say if the concern has been identified, uh, we want to make sure that the administration, the principal, and the superintendent are aware of that concern and that we're effectively training the teachers to work with these student teachers, that we're giving them the resources that they need to allow them to be successful with student teachers in their classroom. We cannot forsake our student teachers at the high university or anywhere else that wants to send them in. They are the future for the next generation of kids and teachers. So um, I will. Uh, I'll say that I was not aware that this was a concern. Since it's been raised, I'll probably be asking uh, Mr. Mark about that. We can come. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay, our next question. And let's see. Um, Bruce, I believe you're first on this one. Levies passed consistently in this school district. Why are we in so much financial difficulty? can only say it's because the state just keeps taking money away from us. Um, it, it seems no matter what we do, we're either down, we either, um, we get more unfunded mandates, which unfunded means they make us do things that cost money, but nobody's backing it up. Um, and, and there's the formula, the funding formula. Oh, God. Chris and I are talking about this. I can't understand it. And the last that we heard, there's been four formulas, funding formulas, since 2008 that the state has changed the formula. Now, if trying to keep up with that is what the treasurer's supposed to do. And that's what I allow him to do, and I trust that he does. And he does a good job of it. He has to take past history of the funding that's been in the school district, then take the vague information of funding that the state keeps giving us and try to come up with a funding that can be given out to the public. 
and he does a pretty good job of hitting it. And that's 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 all I can say on that. I just there's nothing. Thank you, Kim. You're next. <clears throat> well, we're really lucky in Athens that we have such a great community that supports our schools, because a lot of neighboring cities, including Washington County, where my husband and I moved here from, they didn't have nearly the opportunities in the educational system because their levies didn't get passed. So we can overcome and provide drama, and music, and photography at the high school level because we get our levies passed. With that being said, the state is continuously pulling money away. They're implementing a core curriculum, then not giving us any money for new textbooks that supports the curriculum. They're, like Bruce just discussed, there's now a 10 facet program to how much money we're going to get per student. In the past, it was $5,770 per student, give or take. Now, it can, it can swing six figures based off of 10 kids, and they don't even know which way it's going to swing because it's a 10 faceted uh, uh, formula. The state's making it more and more difficult for us to continue to provide education at the high level that we need to provide it without support from our communities. And luckily, Athens in the past has been very supportive. Thank you. Chris? I'd be remiss to start that question without expressing how grateful the board is that the community has supported our levies for the time, the last four years that I've served, for Bruce and the years before that. We're very fortunate a community that we value education so highly. Um, when we talk about why are we in such financial difficulty, well, as you've heard, we've lost a lot of money from other uh, resources, the uh, state of Ohio and the federal government as well. It's made us, uh, I think the reason we pass these levies, though, is there's some trust between the community and the board that we're not going to just reflexively ask for another levy when we have these cuts. Um, I can tell you I've spent a lot of time over the last four years not going to the levy as the first option, but trying to find the efficiency, to try and find the savings, and as a last resort, to find the cut without detracting from our core education mission to allow us to not ask for any more of a levy than we have. Um, when we do reach the point where I feel we're going to have to make cuts to, that would result in pay to play, reduction of busing, and additional loss of teachers. Um, for example, we came to the voters and asked for a levy in this most recent, uh, last year's election. Voters uh, very kindly passed that for us, so we're thankful for that. But um, I think the bad news is when you look at our budget, financial difficulty is still ahead. Thank you. Ellen? I guess my response would be a little bit different. As a businessman responsible for a $13 million unit of our company, I'm not thoroughly convinced that we're in a financial difficulty right now. As reported by the papers this last week from the budget meeting at the Board of Education a couple weeks ago, we have about $7.1 million in the bank on roughly a $30 million budget. And probably are not going to need to, to exhaust that until about the year 2018. And again, I was not at that meeting, but I'm relying on what was reported in the local papers. That gives us approximately four years, maybe five, to look at uh, additional funding possibilities and also taking a very, very, very close look at our budget. Politics aside, a year ago, Vice President of the United States was down at the City Recreation Building, and he related a conversation between his father and himself about business. And the senior Mr. Biden said to his son, show me your budget, and I will tell you what you value. That's a pretty profound statement. And I think this year and next year and every year between 2000 now in 2018, we're going to need to look at our budget, prioritize, maybe move some stuff around, but I'm really not convinced we're in a fiscal crisis that uh, so many people claim that we are. Thank you. I think we have time for about one more question. We need to be out of the building by 8 o'clock, otherwise we won't be, we may not be welcome for future <laughs> meetings, and that would be 
for prioritizing. So we'll have one more question and then closing <laughs> statements. And I'll mention that partly because the order for the closing statements will be the order that would be question 11 if we went on. So you, that's the bottom line there. And Ed Baum picked out precisely the number of questions we could get at. Nice going there, Ed. Okay. So here comes question 10. And um, Alan, you're first on it. What would you change about the schools in Athens? What would you change about the schools in Athens? Oh, wow. I have a granddaughter that's four and a granddaughter that's two. The older of the two will be entering kindergarten next year, August. I would love for her in 13 years to be able to go through a school system where she can have a great education. Now, what does a great education mean? Right now, she's at the Ohio University Child Development Center. And they have a huge garden out there. The kids go out there just about every day. They look forward to it. They look forward to it with enthusiasm and energy because they're doing so many projects. They can't pick them out there, but they've had a project on lemons. And they've done everything from understanding what a lemon is to drawing it to making lemonade, what does it taste like with sugar, without sugar, true energy and true excitement. I'm not saying we don't have this today, but I would love for that kid, when she graduates in who knows what year, 13 years from now, to have that same energy and enthusiasm. I don't think all of our kids are leaving Athens Sky with that energy and enthusiasm. I really don't. We're still, in some cases, fighting consolidation from 1967, where a good portion of our school district doesn't feel like they're part of the district. Perhaps that's because we call it Athens City Schools, but that's state law. It is a city district. We need all of our students to be a part of that district. Thank you. Bruce? I would have to agree with Alan that I certainly want to see all the kids have that enthusiasm from preschool all the way to 12th grade and carry it on to uh, higher education. Um, as far as the change, um, I'm, I'd like to see nothing but change for the better. And that comes from cooperation, comes from help from our taxpayers, comes from the state, from our feds, which I'm not having a whole lot of faith in right now. Um, and, and so, just, I just want to see things progress for the better. It's not going to be an easy road, unfortunately, for us. But, it's, but we can progress, and we can get better. Thank you. Chris? I'm not sure I'm a candidate of change as far as what would I want to change about the school system. Well, I'm pretty happy with the school system. We had a fateful meeting before we closed Chansey. My message to the public was that if I could have things stay as good as they were when I started my board tenure, given some of the challenges that we were facing, I would be very happy as that being my single accomplishment by the end. Um, I'm very grateful for the education that I received at the city schools all those years ago, and I'm very happy with the education my kids have received. So I, since I can't give any higher endorsement than sending my own kids to the school system, I'm not sure that I can say I'm a big advocate to make dramatic change to what we're doing here. Um, so there's always opportunity for improvement, and I'm open to that. Um, you know, we can add courses without detracting from our core education mission. I think that would be a great thing to do. I think our physical plant's going to be a big opportunity for change, and I look forward to hopefully having a chance to take part in that. Thank you, Chris. Kim?
opportunity back into the school system. They're there somewhat, but even more so. Thank you, Kim. Now we'll turn to closing statements, and um, Bruce, you're first. Okay. First of all, I do want to thank Ellsworth, the League of Women Voters, and, and, and the taxpayers, big time. Um, my feeling is, I, I think that Athens City Schools is a very good school system. I think we have very good teachers. I think we have a very good administration. And I think we have a good board. Um, <laughs> my only promise to, to everyone would be this, that if you see fit to put me in for another four years, I can only promise that I will do my best to work with the board to do the best that we can do to give your kids, all the kids, the best education we can with the resources that we have. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Kim, you're next. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone for coming to the forum and being an active member in the community. It's important to get out and vote, and we thank you for taking an active role in it. It's because of the support from Athens citizens in our community that we can provide such a good quality education that our kids currently receive. Like I mentioned earlier, when my husband and I were considering moving back to Athens, one of the very serious things that we considered was the school system in Athens City Schools and what, how many things they can provide our kids that other communities around us can't. But education's changing drastically and not always for the better. As a district, we need to have a voice to protect our students, the teachers and the faculty, so that they can teach the way they know how to teach. You know, yet last, uh, yesterday afternoon, my son called from school and after school, and he was telling me about it's pumpkin week and how they took the state of Ohio and turned it into a pumpkin and made the rivers and the cities and all in the shape of a pumpkin. And then they did math based off of pumpkins and measuring out how to make a pumpkin pie with division. And it was he was excited about school. And that's what we need to see. We need to have that excitement in our schools. And by having somebody that at the schools on a regular basis, hopefully I can bridge that gap between the school system and the board and bring that to the board. Thanks, Todd. I really appreciate you skyping me in and the League of Women Voters for being open-minded to letting me come from Asheville, North Carolina. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Kim. Chris? Thanks. Thank you, Elder. Ed, I was in the league. Uh, I did appreciate the chance to come and speak tonight. I think it's an important function to have everyone sit down and share their vision for the future. Um, I attempted to use my introduction to reintroduce myself. I think we've had a good discussion this evening on the direction of the Apple City School System for the next four years. Um, I think the voice that I would bring is to continue to focus on our core education mission and to continue to pursue the fiscally prudent and conservative, uh, conservative uh, approach to finances that we have um, undertaken. The, the fact is we do have some great challenges in the next four years on many different levels. We will see an operating budget, uh, operating uh, balance of $7.17 million in 2014 go to negative 2.722 by fiscal year 2018 with the way things are presently allocated. It's going to require thoughtful and hopefully productive discussions on how we address that over the next few years in a manner that keeps us out of fiscal emergency but keeps us in step with the great education that our kids have been able to enjoy for the years to date. Um, there's a lot of great opportunities in the year ahead, uh, in the four years ahead. I would be very honored to be considered by you to serve as a member of your board for the next four years. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you, Chris. Ellen? This has been fun. It's also been encouraging. Just many people would turn off the nightly news, <laughs> get in their car and drive to the library, not because they had to, but because they wanted to. Thank you for coming. Earlier we talked about the resource, and I'll direct this to Sam. 
that Ohio University is for the Athens City Schools. But the Athens City Schools are also a resource for Ohio University. If we want our college students to get the best education possible, we need to provide them with the best professors possible. And a professor like Kim chooses a place to live, one of the things they consider is where their children will go to school. We hope that the Athens City Schools are such a school district. Unfortunately, I know of people who have interviewed for jobs at OU that got halfway up the driveway to the parking lot, halfway up the parking lot, the driveway at the high school and turned around and took a job at another school. Doesn't happen very often, but if we lose one great scientist or one great teacher because of that, that's a problem. I was at the state principals convention a week ago Monday. Since 1900, these are all of the things that have been added to what we have asked schools to do. Everything from hygiene education to duck run and cover. Yet we've not changed the length of the school year. We've not effectively changed the length of the school day. Before anybody panics, I'm not advocating year-round school or going to school for 12 hours a day. But we're going to have to change. Why do I want to be on the board? I'm going to use the words of a good friend who wrote a letter. It's in the A News yesterday. Alan will be a catalyst for the board. He is curious and forward-thinking by nature. He is not afraid of asking the questions that need to be asked. And he is energetic enough to help seek answers and solutions. Alan wants Athens City Schools to be greater. Don't we all? Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me give a quick thank you. Our candidates, thank you very much. Members of the news media, David DeWitt of the Athens News, Sam Howard of the Post, Harry and Smedley of the Athens Messenger, thank you for coming and thank you for the questions. They need a round of applause and I can give a signal that way. We've always had multiple thanks to league members and the library, but Todd does a magnificent job. But I'd like to have one special thank you. If Bob, stand up. Ed organizes things we have to do. If he ever chooses to retire, our community is going to be in trouble. And you always have to hear me say, in essence, I think our meeting together tonight is as magnificent an example of government and campaigns and elections as you could find in this world. And I'd just love to be able to take a videotape of this around the world, play it throughout the United States and throughout the world. So thanks, all of you. We had a big stack of good questions we couldn't get to. And you in the audience did a great job of sending them. Thanks, everybody.